Having, having looked at what ONS are doing, I now asked Paul and, um, sorry, uh, and Dar Darren and Katie who are going to talk about the opportunities for us to work with ONS, particularly the opportunities that have been delivered now by the new Digital Economy Act, but all sorts of other areas as well. So if the three of you can come up together, we'll, they'll hopeless, hopefully seamlessly transfer from one to another. And, uh, I'll set, the, set them the challenge to do that. Brilliant, thank you. The clicker is there. And is it obvious even to me what's pressed? It's not obvious to me which way to use it, other than <laughs> and trial and error. Okay. So I haven't got very many pretty pictures at all, I'm afraid, compared to what you've just seen uh, so far today. Uh, my brief was to talk about the Digital Economy Act, and that doesn't lend itself to very many pretty pictures. Um, but it's critical to... Uh, the organisation I'm seconded to at the moment from the UK Statistics Authority, which is the Administrative Data Research Network, which is a consortium of universities, uh, Edinburgh, Belfast, Swansea, Southampton, UCL, uh, with an uh, important coordination role inside uh, Essex University uh, near Colchester. And it exists to try and tackle what has always proved to be a very difficult problem, which is how can the superb administrative data, which is held by government departments, get to be used by researchers for good public science. And the Digital Economy Act is fundamental to solving some of the problems which have always been um, there when trying to release the power of data, administrative data, for better research. So I'm going to, I'm afraid, prevent, present some fairly dry slides, but it is actually a more exciting topic than I've managed to present it. <laughs> That's why you didn't go straight after lunch. That's <laughs> it. Yes, yes, yes. Very wise decision from somebody. I can't even make the clicker work. There we go. So the first thing to say about the Digital Economy Act is it is very simple. It is beautifully simple. If you go and read it, it isn't simple. But actually, that's just the, the, the way le legislation gets drafted. It is actually a very, very simple uh, piece of legislation and a very simple concept that lies behind it. First of all, personal information held by public authorities can be used for research. Now, there should be an asterisk after personal information because there are some conditions which apply. So before the researchers get to use these personal information, these personal data, they do have to be de-identified. But the principle is that if there is personal information which is held by a public authority, it can be used for research. Second key feature of this legislation, public authorities can be assisted by others to get the data ready and to provide the prepared data to the researchers. The weight doesn't fall only on government departments' shoulders. The weight can be shared, hence the value of an infrastructure like the Administrative Data Research Network. Third key feature, existing legal barriers to research are voided. Whatever might have been in the way in legislation before is taken away for these purposes. Crucially, though, they're, they're those uh, protections are replaced by new ones, which I'll come on to in a moment. The fourth key feature is that um, all the duties that were owed by public authorities to citizens' privacy uh, are replicated by new ones, which are actually more useful, more relevant to the domain that these data are going into, into the research domain. So having said it's very simple, let's just look at those one at a time. So it's actually very enabling. Uh, personal information held by public authorities can be used for research. It is enabling, can be, not must be, it can be used for research. So it is indeed any personal information uh, that is not just um, about um, natural persons, but also legal persons. So this includes business data, business records as well. So any personal information from any pub <coughs> public authority, not just central government department, but, but, but also local government too. One unfortunate, in my opinion, exception to that rule is personal health information held by health bodies that are providing national health services in England. Um, that is unfortunately not in the scope of this legislation. But otherwise, without 
proviso any personal information from any public authority can be used for any research which is accredited. And there is the first use of an important word, accredited. Accredited means that the purpose of the research has been considered by the UK Statistics Authority and is thought to be consistent with a code of practice and what is in the public interest. So this legislation is very supportive of partnerships. The second thing I pulled out was that public authorities can be assisted by others to prepare data and to disclose the data to researchers. So any accredited person, <coughs> any accredited person can help extract data, match those data across different sources, derive variables, produce metadata, write code, functionally anonymize the data, and then catalog them and curate them. So if it wasn't for this partnership feature of the Digital Economy Act, all that labor would fall to the owners of the data, the government departments, and therefore uh, an excuse, if I can be unkind, for not providing data for research is taken away because a funded ESRC-funded research infrastructure like ADRN can be that other person and once accredited can prepare data, do all those things, and then, if you're involved in that, further disclose those data in a safe environment to the researchers who are approved to use them. So that partnership feature of this legislation is very, very important. And I think it is a little belatedly, but it is now the case that ADRN is focusing upon these partnerships, trying to work very closely with government departments to provide these services in order to further research which is of interest to the departments and of interest to good science and, of in and, and overall of public interest. So the third feature I've looked at was its power. The existing legal barriers to research are voided and replaced by new protections. So any, this is a, almost a quote from the legislation itself, any disclosure to a researcher does not breach any obligation of confidence or any other restriction on disclosure, however imp imposed. So the common law duty of confidence, uh, any statutory bar of disclosure that there might be in legislation for any of the information held by any public authority is lifted when the purpose of using the data is to prepare it for and then have it used by researchers. But that doesn't mean that it's the Wild West and no law applies anymore. Very sensibly, a, uh, a replacement set of controls is put uh, in their place. In particular, any wrongful onward disclosures that are knowing or reckless can land you with two years of imprisonment or fines. So it has got that responsibility built into it too. The fourth key feature is the responsibility. With, every, with power comes responsibility. So duties that are owed by public authorities to the citizens, the privacy of citizens, uh, are replicated. So here's a list of protections which must be in place. Research data sets must not reasonably likely to be reasonably likely identi to identify an individual. Uh, the risk of accidental disclosure must be minimized. Deliberate wrongful disclosure must be prevented by any body which is assisting with this process. Uh, the helping organizations must be accredited. The research must be accredited. The researchers must be accredited. And the code of practice that governs all this must be observed. All that is in the legislation. And this accreditation and the issuing of the code of practice all belongs to the UK Statistics Authority. The code of practice is out for consultation just now, so uh, please do take a look. So what does this all mean for, uh, in particular, the Administrative Data Research Network and for, for others? Um, it's enabling supportive partnership, powerful and responsible, and I think that's what ADRN should be too, to mirror what the legislation is all for. So the legislation and the uh, ADRN are in effect, outcomes of the Administrative Data Task Force, which government conducted a, few, a couple of years ago now, 
And uh, it's no accident that the features of ADRN and the features of this legislation should be, should be similar. So uh, ADRN is trying to be enabling, okay? ADRN will help extract, link, de-identify, functionally anonymize, describe, curate, and securely disclose research data sets. It has got all those capabilities now, and it's got the capacity to do that work now. Uh, and the best way to do that is in partnership. So uh, what I've been doing with ADRN over the last six months is to try and build four themes around which partnerships can be built. Those are the four themes there. So the Tomorrow's Adults theme, uh, education and transition into employment. That's a theme which is chaired by Tim Lunig and has met, and there are some uh, first objectives which have emerged from that meeting which will turn into design proposals for a new data source built from emissive data provided by Department for Education, ONS, and a number of other departments. The basic concept is uh, the kids who took their Key Stage 2 tests in 2011 were also filling out their census form in 2011, so we should find them in both those sources of data. Because they're in the census, we can find all those who were in the same household as them. So now we've got the um, characteristics of their household members, at least around the time that they were doing their Key Stage 2 tests. Now we've found their household members, we can search for those people in the administrative data sets of DWP and MOJ, Home Office and other places. So what you can build around what otherwise would be quite a relatively sparse pupil record is a whole lot of context about the household they're in, the relationships between those household members, the quality of their household accommodation, and also, of course, what has happened to them since, because in 2016 they took their GCSEs. And then they go on to tertiary or training, and that is also all in the data. So the uh, ambition is to link all this together to create something which doesn't exist at the moment, which is information about the characteristics of learners in the context of the characteristics of their household members and their household accommodation, a 100% sample. The World of Work meetings, chaired by, um, uh, uh, chaired by, I've forgotten his name now. Um, the Growing Old Partnership is chaired by, <laughs> chaired by Catherine Foote, who's from the World Work Centre for Aging Better. Uh, the, that group, which includes, of course, government departments, has, um, uh, is, is going to try to create a very interesting data set of everybody who's 50, in their 50s to see what their income projections are likely to be as they leave their 50s and what their financial security might be for those years that follow their 50s. David Hulpern is the chair of the uh, World of Work theme. <laughs> uh, and there's a couple of things that that group decided to try and build as building blocks. First is an indices of employment quality so that we've got something which is quantitative instead of using the words gig economy or casualization of labor. So modeled on the indices of multiple deprivation, we're going to look at trying to create an indices of employment quality built upon that ONS work which was referred to earlier on. Uh, Productive Society is chaired by Paul Johnson from the IFS, and there, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, the um, desire is to create a building block which is the employee-employer link, and to try and add as many characteristics of employees to the linked characteristics of the employers, and then start to add in some of the more complex stuff such as different types of self-employment and uh, uh, other types of employment into that collection. In all four cases, what we're trying to do is build a, a building block which has got research value immediately, but to build it in such a way that it can be added to and elaborated over time in an iterative manner, because we're going to meet every six months and decide what to do next. So, uh, enabling partnership, powerful. Uh, the necessary expertise to do this is found in the consortium members. There's quite a lot of complicated science to be done here, quite a lot of difficult stuff to be done, but we're quite confident that that capability and that capacity is there in the CSRC funded infrastructure. Um, and the last one, responsibility. ADRN has built itself in order to be readily accreditable as soon as that becomes possible, which we hope is going to be early in the new year. 
so that all those accreditations of the body that can assist government departments and the safe place to put data and the uh, accreditable projects, accredited researchers and so forth, all that is ready to go as soon as the accreditation standards and, all, and the code of practice are published and the operation is in place. We are building ADRN to try and be shovel ready for when that moment comes. So no pictures, I'm sorry about that, but um, I did hopefully expand all the acronyms. I think I did remember to expand all the acronyms, which is the first rule, isn't it? And I did only have a quarter of an hour, so I can hand over. <laughs> it may be dull, but it's extremely exciting. <laughs> Great. Um, I'm not Kate Davis, I'm Darren Tucker. That's Just, me. Yeah, that's Kate Davis. There is a difference. Um, and I work on the commercial data access team for the ONS. My role uh, within the organisation is to try and bring in commercial data for the organisation. And the reason being is that what we have realised is that at the moment the ONS is very much focused on surveys. Um, and as Paul said earlier on, the, the responses to surveys are now dropping off over time. And what we have realised is that there is a greater data source out there that we haven't yet tapped into, both in uh, commercial, third sector and other government departments. So the idea is we would like to, uh, to tap into that and to use that data. I think the biggest phrase that I've picked up on that's being used today is in collaboration. And what we want to be able to do is, even though we now have the Digital Economy Act, which allows us to access both st data for statistics and research. What we actually want to do is to go out and work collaboratively and in partnership with any organisations that we would like to, to access data from. So what we would rather do is to find out what value we can get from your data, but also what we can give back as an organisation. So whether it be um, insights into the data, and hopefully Kate will go into that a little bit more, whether it is um, the ability for secondments of staff um, to actually sit within our organisation or to put staff into your organisations and sort of use your data but use our knowledge as well. Um, at, the, at the moment, uh, what we have got a great experience in doing is getting data from other government departments. What we are still learning is how to get this from commercial organisations. Part of the, the role of my team is to try and get that commercial data in a lot faster. Um, unfortunately it does or it can take quite a bit of time sometimes to get data through the door and what we would actually like to be able to do is to bring it in once but use it many times within the organisation. So the idea being is that we, we identify by talking to organisations what data is available. Um, we then bring it in house for a specific purpose normally for, for one of our inquiries. But then once it's within the ONS, other people can look at it for research and or statistical purposes. They have to put forward a business case, though. They can't just turn around and say, I think my name might be in that data. Can I have a quick look at it? There has to be a specific reason behind it. Um, so that's sort of the, the trajectory that we try and go through. First, it's, it's understand what we want. Secondly, it's confirm what's out there. Um, because the thing we're finding is we don't know a lot of the data that is held by commercial organisations. We think we do, but in conversations with them, what we're actually finding out is either they've got a lot more than we thought or a lot less than we thought. Um, and then we start talking about, can we have access to that? Um, and then that's then when we move into that. So the negotiation and the supply phase are the areas that take most of the time for us at the moment. So it's sitting down with organisations saying, what data do you have? What are you willing to share with us? At what levels? At how often? This kind of thing. Um, and then actually getting it through the door so it's both comes through to us securely and we're then holding it securely. And part of the, the, the work that we have to do is to make sure that once it gets through the door is we're holding it in a, a lockdown situation where no one else can access it, basically, without our permissions. And then what I will do is I will stop now and hand over to Kate. So I'm guessing you've all now had an opportunity to read that one, but I'm going to go back a slide. Um, so just to follow on from a few things that both Tom and Aaron and Paul have said uh, so far today, 
I've been working within the Office for National Statistics primarily on short-term output indicators since 2001. And throughout that time, we've moved from working in SAS and Excel to working in SAS and Excel over the, the same course of the years. We haven't necessarily got any better with the work or, or, or sophisticated with the way in which we do things. Um, in saying that, when I went into the Office for National Statistics, what we did for the retail sales index at that time is still what we do for the retail sales index now. In fact, the retail sales index, in the way it's collected, the sampling methodology behind it, the indexation, except for the change in creating a volume measure, which is now a chain volume measure, hasn't been reviewed or changed since 1986. So therefore, is a need for us to actually think about how we move forward and how we transform. We've recently embarked on a programme of transformation work, and our starting point is actually RSI. And today we've launched a paper um, that will go through our proposals for what this transformation work looks like. But underpinning much of that is how we will use big data in order to pro improve our measurement of the retail output, or retail, uh, the retail sector. To begin with, we've started looking at VAT data. Now, this is useful to us in the sense that when we look at very um, simple businesses within the retail sector, we tend to have a one-on-one -on -one VAT uh, match with the VAT data versus the survey data that we've already collected. When we get into the sort of realms of looking at the much bigger retailers, that becomes far more difficult, and the actual matching to what we hold in terms of records isn't as straightforward now. And as such, what we need to do is to be able to find more than one big data set in order for us to transform. Some surveys may still run in conjunction with these big data sets. However, it is necessary in order for us to move forward and improve what we offer from 1986 to now, we need to actually look for, for better safe data sources. Fortunately, Doug has opened that door for us, so that this group has very much allowed us to make the contacts that we needed, um, some connections, and as a result of that, it's opened doors for us to improve our statistics in a much wider field. As part of the Retail Sales Index, there's a little-known table called the Monthly Commodity Index. And within this monthly commodity index, what we collect is their total retail sales from 31 largest retailers, we have a commodity on food, alcohol and tobacco, and sweets and confectionery, all lumped into one group. There's a commodity on clothing, a commodity on household, and a commodity on other goods. Now, that data, in, in its first instance, can give us some information, but it doesn't give us an, a, an idea of what kind of food is being sold. And, and it, the, the biggest query we have around it is actually around the clothing area, in the sense that can we tell the difference between women's clothing, children's clothing, and men's clothing? Well, actually, from the data we collect, no, we can't. So we need to find something better. So through making these connections, we've worked with a couple of retailers to date, and we've agreed that in the first instance, and something that we've already managed to do, is that we will publish statistics from MCI, okay, with the four category breakdown, rather than in indices, but in pounds, thousands. So allowing users to actually go in and be able to take their, or know what their share is to that cut to that index, to be able to us to be able to take a, a work out a proportion from there. Our next step that we're working on is looking at how we may take data straight from sales systems. Now, there's multiple uses here, not just for RSI, but in maybe how we price data in the future as well. So how could we use this within the Consumer Prices Index? But what we do recognise is that from a, an ONS perspective, um, we're covered by a number of legislation that mean that we have to produce our statistics in a certain way. And much of that legislation needs, it needs us to actually follow certain classification breakdowns. In terms of retail and products, one of the areas that we would need to actually follow is a COICOP classification. I'm not going to go into the full definition of what COICOP is, because we'll be here actually translating this for quite some time. But what this essentially does is allow us to get down to a much more detailed level of data. So we've agreed that as we start to work through that sales systems data, that we'll start to match products from there onto this COICOP classification. The other area we're looking at is, um, and, and something that we're already in talks with the BRC on, is how we may use the categories that BRC collects to a better advantage for retail sales data for the official statistics. 
We know that they have a much finer detail breakdown, and they do have the women's versus men's versus children's uh, clothing breakdown, plus much more, and that will allow us to gain better, provide better official statistics in the longer run. One other thing we're looking at is internet splits. So this is, I have to often explain this to people in the official statistics world because they don't often recognise that there is one mo different. There are different modes of, of using the internet. So when I talk to them about it, we have to talk about channels and think about maybe you have a user use uh, a consumer using an app to purchase something, or they're using traditional web, or they're using a mobile phone to purchase this. And the final area we're looking to explore to improve this data set is a geographical split. Fortunately, with the VAT data that we have, we have some information that allows us to drill down to a much finer postcode level than what we've got within our current business register. So when we actually transform RSI in its first instance, we will have some information there using that VAT data set that will allow us to go down to geography for the first time. The proposal that we've put together and, and refined and is still refining, um, and the retailers that we're working with there is, 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 are listed, we're working at the moment to gain buy-in from their management chains. We're then looking to advise all MCI respondents that are in the sample what we're doing and that they're welcome to join in. And then as a result from that, hopefully snowball out to increase the monthly commodity inquiry sample, but then also to be able to snowball out to RSI respondents as we go. But what we've noted throughout doing this is that there are a number of issues that we're going to face. Um, some of these are listed. I won't go into all details on these because I'm very conscious of the time that we've got. Um, but one of the, the bigger problems we're going to have is collection methods. We've already done some work around web scraping of data, and this allows us to gain prices, but it doesn't allow us to gain, gain a, 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 a quantity figure from those retailers. So there's work to do in that area. Note I've, I've used a traditional spreadsheet there, and that's one of the areas where we think we could collect data far better than our traditional, um, here's a paper questionnaire or an electronic questionnaire to collect. Definitions of categories. So we recognise that retailers have dynamic coding frames and we will need something that's far more stable. So there's going to be a requirement to continually map to COICOP by each retailer or a similar classification. Or we're hoping that Tom's team can help us to actually do some of this work as well. It's also, and it's already highlighted, the difference between accounting and sales systems. So anybody that compares BRC results to official statistics results to the RSI will recognise that sometimes they will diverge from each other. And part of that reason will come from the fact that what's given to BRC is quite a different set of data than what's given to the ONS. There's also going to be some considerable commercial confidence, hence why Darren's heavily involved in this. But one thing that works in our favour is the ONS independence. And what we're using that to actually to, to create, to, is to create some confidence that no individual retailer would gain any commercial advantage without others having the same opportunities. We'll treat everybody in the same way. One of the things that we are looking at is whether we would do this as a published or a closed pilot to begin with. I think at the, in the first instance, one, what we want to do is use this as a closed pilot. And if there are any other retailers in the room that do want to actually work with us on this, we'd very much welcome you getting in touch. But what we want to be able to do is get it right for the small few to begin with and then be able to snowball that out in, its, in, in a good way rather than actually continuously having to tweak as we go. Okay, um, I'm very much going to slip that next slide in a, in a way because I think we've already talked through quite a bit of it. Um, the one thing that we do want to think about is whether or not we can get internet, though, on the same category breakdown. I will say as well that the MCI Pounds Thousands data is now available. It was implemented in August 2017 and is found within the main retail sales release. Our next steps are very much around stakeholder engagement. Um, as soon as we have go ahead to sort of kick off this work in its full entirety, we will start to write to our MCI respondents. We are taking the plan to BRC and we are working with BRC at the moment to understand whether or not we can use a similar data set as to what they're receiving from um, retailers. 
and we're looking to have more of a retail event around March 2018, maybe later on, we're not quite sure yet, when we've had an opportunity to run this for a few months through. There will be obviously a much wider RSI engagement beyond, beyond that point. So I suppose the key message from the way in which we're working with this is that this group, the, the data analysis user group, has allowed us to make connections that we wouldn't have had the opportunity, or that we tried to make the opportunity for before, but we'd never managed to get our foot in the door in, in, a, in a, a way that actually allowed us to make any progress. And the legislation will actually allow us to go much further than that in the future as well. So thank you very much. So it is time for coffee, but I, I want to make two points. First is, Tom has the easy bit, and I, I like doing that bit because prototyping always is fun. But we all know in the data world, to go from prototyping into something that's production, there's a shed load of really difficult work that loads of people just ignore. And people who do prototyping can oversell, in a sense. So those legal things, whilst generating dull slides, are really essential to making long-term change. So thank, thank you very much for that. The, the other thing is, I'd, go for coffee. Don't take too long, because we want to go through three examples of actual data analysis that's happening now. But also, drop your business cards in, so you can keep in touch with the uh, CDRC and get the chance of winning this book. It's, it's the, one, a mapped book of all sorts of bits of London. It's a fantastic book. I had have looked at it myself, but uh, I'll, I'll leave it for anybody else who's... It's James Cheshire who wrote it, and it, it got lots of publicity. If you want a copy of the book, put your slide in, and I think they'll only send you a new sheet once every six months or so. But I had to say that just so they were properly consented. Have your coffee, and I'll see you in about, about half past three. Thanks very much. Cheers.